Hi everyone, tonight is Thursday, October 6th, 2016, and this is our second meeting for our Adult Basic Education Open ABE MOOC. My name is Jennifer Madrill in Chicago, Illinois, and we've assembled a panel of subject matter experts in adult basic education, as well as instructional design, uh, who are facilitators in our course. And our purpose tonight is to field questions from our uh, participants in the MOOC. And so with that, let's just go ahead and jump right into our agenda and start tackling some questions. As I mentioned, our primary purpose tonight is to have an open question and answer session with people who have joined us tonight from the course, our course participants. And then we may not have time to get through all of these items, and if not, we have a link to our show notes or our slides that will include in uh, on the website and on the course site so in case you want to uh, check back and look at the important dates that we have coming up as well as how to access things in our course such as the peer-to-peer -peer connection and then um, ways to join groups we may not get to all of that tonight um, but in case we don't we'll have links to all of that information and then really like I said the the focus of tonight is for our open question and answer so we're going to start with that and then we'll conclude with that um, for the, uh, the remainder of our session tonight. But before we get into the questions, I do want to spend a couple moments talking about some important dates that we have for the remainder of our course. We have a pretty firm date of December 4th that will be the conclusion of this course. So even though our course materials will remain available online, the facilitation for the course officially ends on December 4th, and that's the last day to turn in your deliverables for the course. And we have two more live webinar dates set. One is October 27th, and the next is November 17th. And that will be the last two live sessions we have in our course. And then I wanted to bring to your attention two conferences that are coming up that will affect a lot of the facilitators and some participants in the course. One is the AECT um, convention that will be held in Las Vegas from October 17th through the 23rd. And then we also have the Open Education Conference in Richmond, Virginia, which runs from September 2nd to the 4th. And again, that affects um, a lot of the facilitators as well as some of the course participants. So there will be a little bit more of a skeleton crew hanging out in the course over those dates. Uh, but we'll certainly have uh, a lot of backup and then people will be checking from the road when they're able. And I also wanted to talk a little bit about um, excuse me, I talk about Ed Impact 16. It's our fall fundraising campaign for Designers for Learning, and it's on Saturday, November 12th, 2016, and everyone is invited. It's a free webcast-a-thon. So it's going to be a 12-hour webcast that will begin at 9 in the morning, uh, 9 o'clock Eastern, and run until 9 o'clock p.m. And we've assembled a panel of invited featured speakers. A new speaker will join us at the top of each hour. We have 12 speakers, and uh, it'll be a, a, a low-key, relaxed day where um, we were able to talk about different topics uh, relating to impact and what impact you will make. And uh, we'll talk to the panelists and the featured speakers about what they perceive to be their greatest past successes and what they're currently working on and then needed future innovations. So that should be a pretty fun day for you to mark on your calendar and join us again on um, on Saturday, November 12th. So let's just go ahead and jump right into one of the biggest questions we have received in the past as well as what we're already starting to see in the questions that we're receiving in the course in our discussion forums. And it's this whole idea of real world problems and tasks. And to start out this conversation, I'd like you to think a little bit about the difference between problem-centered instruction versus topic-centered instruction. And if you've had a chance to read in Module 2, we, um, we start out by talking about Merrill's first principles of instruction, and that is a problem-centered focus. And what we're talking about here is that the instruction is um, embedded in a pro real world problem or task and that's in contrast to a topic-centered instruction where the topic is presented 
without regard to the context. Um, it's kind of devoid of context. And really where this all comes together, again, and this is all covered in Module 2, is in this concept of con contextualized instruction. And so um, it's covered quite well in Module 2, um, and, and there's some links to additional resources that you can go out and read more about this. But just to give kind of a high-level overview of what it is we're talking about, um, you're basically embedding your the skills and knowledge that you're trying to, to teach within a real-life scenario. Um, and so we give some examples here on this slide. Uh, given this is an adult audience, the, the contextualized lesson may revolve around something such as registering to vote or applying for a driver's license or finding a job and some of the, the skills that you may um, use in a job interview, you could then create a lesson, for example, around a simulated uh, job interview or maybe seeking out um, different types of jobs that may be available in a, in a particular career or in a typical um, field. Uh, and so, again, the idea is you're not necessarily just covering a topic that's related to a skill or knowledge, but rather you're Im embedding the, the, the teaching of these skills and knowledge into a scenario or a context that will be directly related to what the person is um, interested in currently um, and what they will one day potentially uh, in encounter in their jobs or in their future careers. So what I'd like to do now is turn it over to our other panelists to help me try to explain um, some examples of real-world problems and tasks and how it re may relate to the projects that we're working on in this class. I think one of the one of the key takeaways from what I what I just heard was really um, if if our participants have some experience in K twelve, like my background started in K twelve and I've slowly moved into higher ed from there. Um, is that learners in, in the context of the lesson plans they're making for this course have a lot of life experience that, you know, the, yeah. if I was in K-12 that they, they wouldn't have necessarily. And so it, it does become about those real tasks of this is an event that happened in my life and they have that experience and you can have really rich discussions um, and, and tasks for them to, to do. Say, Jason, do you want to hop on? I don't know if you have if you have audio handy. Do you want to share your ideas? It looks like you were starting to generate an idea for our context. It might be kind of fun to, if you're game to, to do that. I can um, promote you if you're. You want to put in the text chat if you've got your audio handy. And that was to Jason Hogan. I don't know if you heard me. Right, or anybody else for that matter, if you're interested in. Uh, I'd like to add just one more thing to all those comments. Um, there, I, I, I've seen a couple of uh, or more lessons that do apply uh, math or reading and writing to real life situations that don't relate to the student's goal. So let's say, oh, I'm I'm gonna do uh, I'm gonna teach uh, uh, fractions in uh, uh, through recipes. That's a okay, you know. If I want to be a chef, uh, that's a good way to teach me fractions. But if I'm a carpenter and hate cooking, um, even though recipes are real life, um, it would be better to teach it through uh, the eyes of the student. So beyond being real life, it's important to identify the interest of that persona and address that person's goal. That's how we hook people. I don't need to know a ha well, but a hammer if I'm gonna be a health uh, professional who's never gonna use one. So it's uh, there's an additional aspect to that. Yeah, that came up um, today actually in the uh, module two. And one of my recommendations for that is the person said, well, how do you design instruction for every conceivable student interest? And my recommendation was to, when you're designing something, as, as Kim said, um, when you're thinking of decimals or whatever it may be, you can pretty quickly come up with a couple different scenarios. And uh, you know, this is something I did in my graduate classes that I would teach, is just to give people the opportunity to pick. 
you know, is, are you interested in creating a recipe or would you be more interested in, you know, give them like a couple different things. So the, 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 the flow of the lesson is, is roughly equivalent. It's just a matter of what the context is that you're building it around. And it doesn't take all that much more time to, to be able to do that when you, um, when you're, when you're laying out the shell of your lesson. So, Hey Jason, sorry, I just, <laughs> I just catapulted you right into the um. Just just before we continue the, the catapulting of Jason, there are a couple of quick comments that uh, came in. One is, um, actually, I'm going to start with just tying on to what you were just saying, uh, Jen, with the one of the, I guess, hurdles when designing OER, and I've seen many groups struggle with the, well, how do we make this thing that's for everyone? And that's uh, exactly not the point. The point is to really build it into this this context as Jen just described where um, it can be really specific down to like the carpenter or the baker or the nurse and then the beauty of the OER is that uh, if you made uh, this fractions module for somebody that wants to be a nurse I can come along and as an industrial arts teacher who used to teach people about carpentry I can say oh I really like the structure of that and the supporting materials so because it's openly licensed I can grab those and change it and so I'm not designing for everyone I'm really designing for this narrow situation um, there was a question that came in around the how what's the duration of these lessons so I'm hoping that our uh, adult basic education subject matter experts can maybe talk a little bit about like how long you might have your students or how long a lesson might be in this context this is Michelle, and I would I would say that um, most class periods aren't going to be longer than fifty minutes. Um, and when when you think about a lesson, it's it's usually is covers a shorter duration, and uh, you might have a unit of instruction that covers several class periods, comprised of multiple lessons. But I, I would say somewhere around the fifty minute range. Um, for most students and uh, you know from the beginning from the introduction to where they're it's scaffolded and they're they're off and they're practicing and uh, applying what they've learned so that's what i would suggest um, yeah, i would agree with like, that i would agree with that I would say, uh, yeah, I agree with a 50 uh, in a structured program, federally funded. That's usually the the period. But um, also, it, uh, as you as people design these, get a, a put a goal out there. And I like, and I've mentioned this in uh, I think in uh, discussions, backward design. What do you want to see at the end of this? And if it's too big as you're designing it, just whittle it down. It might take an hour, it might take three, it might take four sessions, it might take one. And uh, see what naturally f uh, falls into the goal for that lesson. And it could be just a piece of it. I mean, it might just be one lesson for an objective out of a whole goal. And uh, it's, it's something that is, is fun to play with as an instructor. And I find that teachers often. Uh, remodel their lessons a lot before they come out with a final product to see that it fits a certain time period. And then I'll just put my little designer, freelance designer hat on and um, you know, part of our goal in this class is to get people to think like a designer. And so if you were charging somebody for your time, you would be pretty aware of the scope of the project you were developing because there's definitely a correlation. The longer your lesson, the longer it's going to take you to design it. And so we really recommend as a starting point, everyone to this point, we've, this is the fifth iteration of this course, and we pretty much cap things to try to think of things as like one sitting or one class session, which as we've just defined is about an hour or less. Um, and so for most people who've taken this course in the past, they've reported, self-reported that it takes about 40 hours to complete our course, including finishing their project. So if you decide you really think that's too limiting and you want to write, design something longer, you know, that's kind of on you. <laughs> Just realize that the, the longer the lesson you design and the more sessions you design in your lesson, that that's going to then be more design time for you to spend. And again, keep your, keep your eye on the prize as far as when you're uh, you know, in the real world and designing. Um, that's money out of your pocket if you, if you miss the mark and 
you commit to doing a three hour lesson and you think you can do it in 40 hours or whatever the number of the correlation ends up being there between, um, you know, whatever that number ends up being. But um, so do keep that in mind. And Jason, we brought you on. <laughs> How are you? So you're now you were with us the first iteration, right? Uh, I was with you in the spring. In the spring. Oh, that's right. That, yeah, that's okay. my yeah. first first MOOC, let's say. And now you're back, um, giving it, a, giving it your world again. So, can you tell us a little bit about what you guys have been doing as far as your live streaming? Because that's kind of cool. I think people would be interested to hear what you're doing. You know, maybe they'd want to join you on on that and watch watch or follow along. Well, we definitely love to have more people participate in. So, uh, with the live stream, what it is is uh, Brittany, who's done a couple of streams for this course already and myself uh we're just talking about how we wanted to create kind of like this online place for instructionals like instructional designers to throw ideas at each other and get feedback and get support um i know i'm pretty new to the field i think she's pretty new to the field also so it's kind of like a let's learn from each other let's help each other out and that kind of thing um so we've been live streaming a couple of things that we've been working on in terms of uh, projects through work and then this course came up as a uh, its fall offering and I suggested that we both participate in this because it'd be a great place to, to find more community um, and it's for a good cause yeah. it will keep me <laughs> honest and force me to finish the course <laughs> but and um, I love, can you explain then what you're doing with um, your think alouds because it's just for me as a facilitator it's so awesome because it's like I can pry open your brain and like you know look to have a look inside you know for what you're thinking about uh, from your designs yeah so what I do is I try to like I try and like at the course a little bit but not get too much done and then i open up a gigantic photoshop file and use that as a whiteboard and try and think a little bit outside of myself so i try and think about the persona uh that i'm working with i just write down the ideas or any thoughts that i've had that uh have interested me a little bit um and i just put it out there and hopefully there are people in the chat that are like this is stupid what are you doing you should be thinking about this or like hey this would be a lot better if you did this or i like this thought uh i think you're on the right track and kind of just like that little bit of feedback uh is always super helpful so um, can you put in the text chat how we can find you is the, be is the best way to i'm doing my job and feel like i'm getting a little bit better with it um, and so how's the best way to find you? Is it um, like, uh, through Twitter as far as like when you're going to do the next one or how people can review your um, YouTube video and maybe give you some feedback? What's the best way for people to find you? Um, Twitter is good. Um, so I, I know Brittany and I usually tweet a couple of times before we turn our stream live. I think Brittany, she, I think she was wanting to stream today, um, but I think that got put off till tomorrow. So Brittany should be streaming on uh friday and i should be streaming my goals tuesday afternoon so that would be about uh 3 30 uh 3 34 p.m uh eastern standard time um so i'll be doing it just after my work perfect so um, if you could put your twitter um handle in um in the check chat that would be fantastic yeah, so i'll put i'll put both Brittany. so this is Brittany, and this is me um and those are both of us on Twitter, um, and then we'll be tweeting to OpenAve and that kind of stuff. So thanks for getting that out there. Um, yeah, I, I think that. it's great. I think it would be great if um, there's, there's more things outside of just the, something generated by the um, facilitators. It'd be great if you're know, like these spin-off live things happen. That that's awesome. I highly encourage yeah. it. <laughs> No, it's good. I thought I, I thought this would be uh, a, a good way of connecting with others. And hopefully, if anybody else is interested in putting their thoughts out in the public, which is kind of scary whenever you say it like that, um, and want to join us, like definitely reach out because we'd like that. It's great. Um, I know there are a couple others in the course that want to do live streams, like uh, uh, Kristen Anthony uh, does her podcast. I think she might be doing, I don't know if she wants to do streams, but. I know she's participating in OpenAbe. Yeah, perfect.
perfect. Well, thank you. That's right. Thank you for, for summarizing that. And then um, Jason was a, a pioneer. Does anyone else want to, want to jump on and uh, ask some questions? You've got the panelists here. Or you, you've, got, you've got the mic if you're interested. Does anybody else want to jump in? Just type in the text chat if you're interested. Highly recommend it, even though it scared the crap out of me whenever you pulled me in. <laughs> I did, my screen went dark for a second. I was like, what happened? <laughs> oh, no, I'm on camera. <laughs> Well, I've got my laundry hanging behind me, so uh, <laughs> it's a pretty low bar that we're setting tonight. So Alex, or I'm going to the list here. Anybody want to jump on? Ruth, Susan, Cindy? That was a really good time to get some one-on-one. -on -one yeah, it's a great time to get some. Got all the facilitators here. Otherwise, we're just going to go into some canned questions that were already kind of answered in the class. Yeah. So one idea of any anybody's doing English that I just put in chat that I got pulled into this for. Um, I think that um, a cool project would be writing a letter on behalf of a charity or something like that for funding um, and pulling the ownership for the uh, the student to select a charity that they really enjoy um, or they'd really like to support but kind of making them an advocate on behalf of that so there's a little bit of almost responsibility there. Um, yeah, so any, any thoughts on that from our facilitators? How would that go over with your classrooms? Like how would you, um, how, would, how would they, that would be, how would that be received by your students? Kim or Kaya or Lisi or Michelle? To have them write a letter for, uh, repeat that again, I'm sorry. I must have missed something there. Like on behalf of like a local charity or something like that, like to write, a letter on behalf of like the Humane Society or something like that to uh, a local government for more funding for a project or something like that. So I don't know. It's a sketchy start to an idea. In terms um, of the we actually, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, please. We actually um, took the idea of writing and and had a class where because um, we are a nonprofit. And where they would they came up with a um, grant idea, and um, they did some research as far as like trying to put together a budget for what it would cost for a program, and um, it really taught them a lot as far as how to technically write, how to um, even use their percentages that they learned in class. So that was uh, that was kind of a one-off thing that we did that um, they were very interested in. I'm a big believer in project-based learning that uh, as long as it matches the interest and, uh, and well, the interest of the student and, and those ideas are good projects, really good projects because they have an outcome and people get involved and each one has a part. Um, I know that Susan Jones is on on the call, and I don't know if she she, um, she has some great ideas and comments. Uh, well, Susan, you're in the classroom. Can you uh, contribute uh, to this discussion? Yeah, did you, Susan, do you have a, a mic? Do you want me to pull you in? If you, if you just type in the text chat if you're interested in coming in. Oh, you're not in the classroom. Okay, I thought you for some reason you were. Well, you you certainly uh, uh, act as though you are very. Oh, you're in a tutory center. Okay, mm -hmm. so you're in a tutory center that is not federally funded, and you teach all day. So, uh, any comments on what's being discussed? Yeah, she did mention that uh, her students don't think at the charity organization level was. Okay. And then, yeah. Uh, yeah, I could see that. It probably depends on the, um, the, the students you're working with, I would assume, right? Yeah. And the idea is hook the student, and if, if that's their interest, they, uh, there's um, a whole movement that's been uh, uh, around for many, many years called service learning. And in fact, this MOOC is a service learning uh, project. And, and that involves students in really contributing something to their community while they're learning all these academic skills. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. I think uh, Denise just put in a, a really interesting question. How about uh, the soft skills such as interpersonal skills like communication, self-esteem, collaboration, and teamwork? Um, how are these skills kind of integrated into the adult basic education context and into these lessons? I can, I've done some work with um, teachers on doing this very thing um, because it is a big, big thing, a big push right now. Um, uh, there's a, a huge focus on that the high school credential just isn't enough. So preparing students to for work in post-secondary education are a big um, component of most programs now. So one of the things that I've done is help them to go back through existing lesson plans and embed um, and identify. Sometimes they're already there, some of the employability skills, and just highlight those and raise them, you know, and just state it explicitly. Um, so they don't feel like, oh, it's just another thing to add to this. But I think in looking at the types of activities that you might be using, if you're doing group discussions or you're having folks determine roles and responsibilities in a project, um, you know, communication skills, and those, those are all things that you can embed within um, and contextualize within um, the lessons that you're teaching academics or um, technical skills. And, Another component of this, though, is that you build in some way, just like you do with academic, to assess the student's mastery of those skills. So it's, it's, not, it's one thing to say, oh, hey, we're going to teach you how to communicate, you know, active listening skills. But if you don't have an assessment, and it doesn't have to be a form, you know, this huge deal, but you, have, you need to have some built-in assessment within the lesson to identify that it can be a simple rubric that the student can do a self check and then you can kind of say, oh, here's what I saw and you saw and then you can have a conversation as an instructor. Um, I just really think um, that, that's a great idea and a great point um, and it's very much needed in adult ed right now. Um, mm -hmm. Yes, and the question is about standalone and they are standalone but I mean, adult education, um, at least in the federally funded programs, they can't just teach a job skills program. So for them, it, it has to be contextualized in some way or embedded in the academic um, skills that they're teaching. I'm glad that uh, Denise brought up uh, uh, these uh, uh, collaboration and teamwork as well. As And I totally agree with you, Michelle. There are ways of teaching to the student and still incorporating all these methodologies that help students work together. As a matter of fact, uh, the scans back in the 90s and now there's a new whole set of uh, uh, definitions for what workers want. And one thing that they say across the board, the biggest organization, the biggest, biggest businesses and even small organizations say, that the one skill that we don't teach students is how to work on teams. And it's a very, very difficult thing to do because uh, ordinarily some of us like to make it, uh, but we don't care if we stay up all night and finish it and nobody else does it. We'll do it because we want a good grade. And uh, how do we grade the people that don't do anything? And it's the same thing that employers face. So, Collaboration and teamwork, uh, they're very uh, essential skills that we can incorporate into how we teach within the classroom. I think it's funny. Everyone's intimidated, but you did. Uh, did everybody see my laundry literally hanging behind me? So <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully, I didn't do that. I should have put that out more in the room. <laughs> I'm sorry we're intimidating, but we're a very uh, low-key group, so don't please don't feel intimidated. I didn't see that. <laughs> yeah, Denise said she was too intimidated to come on to talk with us, so I didn't. <laughs> um, Michelle, that link that you posted to the employability skills, can that be, sorry, did you post that just in this chat, or is it also available in uh, the Canvas course shell? And your mic's off. I, I gotta unmute go. myself. Um, I just posted it here, so I can post it in the um, course too. Oh, and Katie's got a perfect. Okay, this is perfect. Uh, Katie, do you? I, okay, I'm gonna keep <laughs> calling on people. Katie, do you want to come in to the text chat or to the uh, the panelists? 
I, I mean, I, I hate to just, I can do it automatically, but that would be a main thing to do. Okay, excellent. Okay, hang on, let me get you. Uh, Woo. Woohoo! <laughs> Seamless for me. It takes like three little. Okay, hang on a second. I'm having trouble walking and chewing gum here. Okay. So hopefully this worked. There we go. So Katie, you are unmuted and ready to go. Can you, you want to try your audio? Let me unmute you. Yeah, I think I heard you. Okay. Go can for you it. hear me now? We can. Go okay, ahead. Yeah, can... what's your question? Let's see. Yeah, you can see my husband playing a video game in the background. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's not as much a question, just a struggle right now because I chose Crystal as my learner um, because she went through school. She completed high school, um, but she doesn't have the skills that she needs. And I have a teacher friend who's teaching, I think, seventh grade history. And that's what he talks about all the time is people, the kids that just get pushed through onto the next grade and they're not getting the skills that they need to get. But I'm struggling with how to choose that contextual application because her persona isn't as specific as some of the others. She's not the carpenter. She's not the mechanical person. Um, she just wants to, you know, uh, pass the GED so she doesn't have to take the remedial classes so that she can get a better job and provide for her daughter. So I'm kind of struggling with knowing what context to use for that. Katie, I'll, I'll start off. Um, uh, what you're describing is the adult, it's the adult student who comes to our programs and they've never thought about goals. They don't even know that they have um, any power over their lives in most cases. So uh, in, a, an, in a typical adult ed program, they'll go through what they, we call goal setting and it's a long process of saying, you can uh, you know, reach what you want, let's define it more. I encourage you, and I know others will have an input here too, but I encourage you to um, define this persona so that she does have uh, an interest and then address your lesson to that interest. Um, so, yeah, she wants to improve her reading and math skills. A lot of our students come in and they improve their reading and math skills and go back to flipping hamburgers because they don't have, they haven't defined their interests. And I think part of our job, and you can't do that in your lesson, but you can define your persona that way. Think about what she might be interested in and then defi uh, design your lesson to attract her in that way. I'm just going to take a quick stab, and maybe Michelle, you can help me. Um, Michelle shared with us, it, we used it in, um, you, the links are available in module one, where we, they're, they're the employability skills, and then they're also the career clusters. And so to help you out as the designer and tying into what Lisey said, if you kind of envision a path for her, and uh, maybe if you go into one of those career clusters, or maybe a job that she might one day aspire to, to, to get, uh, aside from, as Lacey said, flipping burgers. And so if you go into those links that are in module one, the you know, employability skills as well as in the career clusters, you can see what skills are necessary to be able to take on that, what they need to master in terms of the skills and knowledge, knowledge for a particular career path. And that may help you as the designer pick something um, to focus on because the persona, as you said, it kind of ends with like where she is now, not necessarily very forward thinking beyond potentially getting a GED or whatever it may be. Um, but Michelle, would you mind kind of um, elaborating what, on what I was just talking about as far as the, this, the link you shared with us with the employability skills and the career clusters and how those work in terms of designing a lesson? Sure. Um, the career clusters are more the occupational skills that cut across um, several um, specific technical occupations. So I posted a link here too to a PDF that lists like a broad category. So like you might have construction, you might have uh, transportation and logistics, but then there are specific careers within that um, cluster. So you, if, a, if you do some type of, for this person, you could have a lesson around 
for doing a career search, um, I, you know, a student inventory, or, you know, part of intake processes sometimes um, have them identify that. I would say also that you could also contextualize it within what's needed for the academic setting, which would include, like, how to, you know, do a search for admissions, write out the pros and cons, you know, compare and contrast different schools and the costs and, and things like that as she as she identifies what the skills are and the education that's needed in order to achieve whatever um, career goals she might have or educational path. And so it's, it is like looking at, the career clusters are looking at this bigger, broader picture so that you can teach a number of students um, like we were talking about within a certain occupation. Um, and then when you get into specifics, that's more about where Susan was talking about in the curriculum she shared around transportation and logistics, where it's around the specific career um, and has specific technical skills that are needed in order to, to work in that field. I think for her, um, you know, it sounds like, like Lisey said, it's like the students who do come to our programs who are, um, they think it's just the GED or the high school credential that they need, but it's, it's helping them to identify there's something beyond that and, um, and helping them access that. So I think you could contextualize a lot of, you know, I always say the FAFSA should be a life skill. Um, learning how to complete the application for federal financial aid, uh, you know, putting that within the context, she needs to know budgeting for college, how can I pay for it? What are some of the sources and resources helping her develop some research skills? Um, so you could do research around all these different, you know, looking for a career, looking at schools, budgeting for education. Um, yeah, uh, Susan suggests what colors your parachute doing that. There's a student inventory that's free online to determine your career um, interests. Um, does that help? <laughs> yeah, I think it does. I think I was too focused on trying to find something specific and not looking yeah. beyond that. Yeah, and I think you, this person isn't ready maybe for that specific career, but looking at some of the broader things that you can contextualize the academic skills within. And as somebody said, Perhaps not just the GED, but thinking about all that range of skills that you need to, critical thinking skills and in the broader um, context that students need to have in order to be successful in post-secondary education. Mm -hmm. I totally agree, Michelle. Yeah. Um, and then uh, Jason brought up a good point, too. You know, in the personas, it talks about things such as just her, where she is in terms of her formal education and that she gets frustrated when things don't come easily. And then the question is, how do you, um, by knowing that, how would that influence your design? Um, any, any thoughts on that from, from is Kaya back from her, her gas saw <laughs> Costco run or whatever? <laughs> Kaya, we haven't had a chance to hear from you. I don't I'm know. I'm back. I'm back. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. You are the most, she, she will fight through a hurricane to join us. So thank you win the award tonight. Um, I don't know. Do you want to take uh, take on this one because it's kind of you know more of a, a design type question? Like, how do you contemplate things such as that? Like where they're at from a um, like kind of more of an affective standpoint? How they are their readiness to to learn and their uh, their feelings and emotions around around formal education? Any thoughts on that? Oh, um, let's see. It's a loaded question. There, it Jennifer. is a big one. It's a big one. Yeah. Big one to answer and just, uh, you know, I, I think, um, I think, I think, because when I look at these uh, scenarios and that first week I gave a couple of feedback, I think um, one of the things we're playing with right now from a design perspective is looking at some alternative frameworks to build on that motivation aspect of uh, bringing them to the learning yeah, and hitting on the emotion. And that would be one is a, a design framework that uses a storytelling or, uh, or using, so for example, today we were working on a, looking at some design things. Like we had a little video of a, of a, about a minute and 33 a clip on a very dismal situation of a kid from Syria. 
And then we took the emotional part that the kid was going through in the displacement and the trauma of war. And then we build the, we were looking at building the design of a, a couple of courses interdisciplinary basically more you know one was looking at it from the psychology aspect of it one was looking at it from the in the scenario we built there's a little cartoon thing that we built where she interacts with her friends and her other people and the and her dad is going to now come back and from the war so we kind of went around the emotional part of engaging with the lesson uh, um, by building that from a design perspective is what I'm talking about, is getting the, getting the learner to a point where, um, where they see they, they want to be involved, you know, and, and trying to put catalysts, we call them, we call them, what is the catalyst that's going to get the learner to want to stay, to want to learn, to want to do some of those things that in our, per, our some of our personas are, more, many of them have motivation issues uh, and the way those are built up, which is typical of that group. Mm -hmm. So from a design perspective, we were, were trying to work on keeping the learners in the lesson because if we lose them in the lesson, then the content is lost. So it's not so much content pushing as much as and you'll, you'll be there, uh, I know the rest won't, I don't know, you'll be there at AC. I'll show you a couple of those kinds of things so you can get an idea about those frameworks that we're talking about. But I think the, the vested thing is to bring in, um, you know, to keep them both cognitively and emotionally connected with the lesson. I think that's what I would push for, a framework that uses an alternative to just text-based. Because remember, that is exactly what these personas, a lot of them don't like. You know, mm -hmm. they don't like to read a lot. They don't want their, they lose focus. They don't want to. So this is definitely a group for which we would want an alternative uh, framework to look at. Yeah, and Susan mentioned um, small. I think this is related to the question, like small, small successes. Um, so uh, lots of checkpoints for checking for understanding, checking for as like you said, if they check, yeah, he or she checked out. Um, you know, those types of things it's are kind of like looking at uh, building a culture of learning because they they missed out those personas that we have. They missed out on that culture of learning for multiple reasons, whatever that reason may be. So to bring them into that culture of learning, um, we and it's not just so much dangling a carrot with a, a little thing like a badge or a, a little extrinsic thing, but it's the it's to keep them. What do they want? Why would they want to be in this class? Besides, you know the 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 big picture, oh yeah, your GED is going to help you. No, they, they know that. They, but they still, how do we keep them in the lesson so that they're motivated to learn the math or the, so, and I think that the, I think this is one place where those alternative frameworks that we're working with St. Leo is really, really cool. I think in terms of that. Yeah, no, nice job. I, I did kind of throw you up. <laughs> throw you, throw you a tough one. Ahead, the Jim. the direction I totally as soon as you said alternative frameworks and motivations in the same sentence I almost was like oh she's going to talk about arcs, um, <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> oh, no, no, no. but uh, I think really like what you're speaking to so like arcs is what attention relevance yeah. confidence and satisfaction yeah. and really it like the relevance I think is what uh, Lisi's always talking about with exactly. you know make it something that's happening in their life and those check your understandings is like what i build into modules all the time where it's like right. hey like you kind of did this thing and it's a tool to build that confidence which i i think without using that word uh you were speaking to kaya that like leads to their their ultimate satisfaction and, and goal right. so not to framework everyone to death but that's exactly <laughs> where my mind went as you were speaking yeah that's precisely and i kind of today was looking at those uh those uh, less those courses are getting ready to be deployed, and I was thinking, oh wow, you know, I see, you know, there's a place for that. I mean, I would not possibly use it in, a, in my graduate instructional design course because I don't think they yet need to play games with things they could. But you know, but I think for audiences such as this, where motivation is a huge factor, having something presented with a framework that addresses the arcs components, you know. 
and yet has the a cognitivist um, um, philosophy built into it. And I think the connectedness of some of the things we're looking at in terms of keeping the learner in the zone, basically. If we lose them in the zone, we're not, no matter how good we tell them the doses, they're not going to be good, you know. Okay, well, from a practical standpoint here, we came up across the, the, the one hour mark. So I'm going to consider from here on out post show. <laughs> so I'll stick around until the last uh, person is standing to answer some questions. But certainly our panelists, thank you for your time. And if you need to, to cut out, please, you know, feel free. It depends on what your, your timing is. Um, same for anybody else here. And in the meantime, um, thank you for your participation. And, and in the meantime, I'll try to take a crack at some of the questions that um, and Jay, uh, JR, did you see any questions maybe that we? I think the only unresolved one, I, no, I just closed it. Uh, let's see here. Um, what is being done, or, or I guess, what does critical thinking or, or helping students develop critical thinking look okay. like in this context? Oh, okay. Um, anybody here want to give me a, a little helping hand with that? Whoever's left, or do we have? Uh... Lisa, do you have a Kim, one of, yeah, Kim, please go ahead. Um, one of the things that I put in there was, um, and, and one of the, the things that I talk to my students all the time about because they get very frustrated with math, and I tell them that math teaches you critical thinking skills because you have to stop and you have to discern what information is relevant to solve a problem, what isn't, where do you put it in the equation, and then following steps. And I find with most of my students in GD, um, a, a lot of them have not been successful in traditional schools because they struggle with ADD or ADHD. And getting them to slow down and to really work through, specifically in the beginning, to work through story problems where they need to pull out critical information and then discard some information, we find that their critical thinking skills increase tremendously. Um, and they go from that basic comprehension to actually analyzing information. Um, and then when we get them finally into science, you can see them being able to take information and actually make a hypothesis, which is something that we would have never been able to do in the beginning if we did not work through those critical thinking skills with math. If that makes sense. Yeah, it does. <laughs> and Yeah, and then uh, Michelle, I, I, Lisa, maybe you could pick up on what Michelle was reiterating your, your point about projects. To me, the, the best way to get tackle something like critical thinking is to have a pretty robust scenario through a project that you're working on where you're, and it ties into what Kim was just saying, you know, when you, you you engage them in something um, outside of just saying, okay, now we're going to day to day learn about critical thinking, but it's tied in with the other subjects. So, Lisa, did you want to yeah. tie in um, your thoughts that you kind of mentioned earlier on this? Yeah, I, uh, people often go to Bloom's taxonomy for that, and there are so many layers of addressing one single thing. And as um, Michelle just mentioned, going from like if you read something, you read at the uh, what happened, who, what did she do, and then there's uh, what might have happened, what might she have done, and then if you were that person, what would you have done, and what would, and just going beyond the, the, the basic level of interpreting problems, math problems, or reading your charts or anything, so that uh, the student begins to connect uh, mindfully with content so it's not just uh, right or wrong black and white um, and there is Webb's high I forget the name of the Webb's hierarchy of needs or something like that that is a uh, the update on Bloom's taxonomy that really is a very good uh, yeah. way it's called Webb's hierarchy yeah it's kind of uh, even yeah. beyond the new bloom it's called web w-e-b-b -B. Uh, yeah yes yeah mm -hmm. <laughs> and using those verbs in objectives, and we'll, we'll be getting into objectives pretty soon, and I think that using, just taking those verbs, the objectives can take people beyond just uh, 
the lower levels, but analyzing, evaluating, synthesizing, and those are great terms for objectives that lead lessons into higher levels of critical thinking. Um, uh, I, I wanted to address a question that Phil Morris asked. Uh, if you think of a mother as being profession, a uh, profession, would that help? And you know, if if programs are funded by the federal government, they're very workplace and, and oriented, job oriented. But otherwise, uh, I don't think anyone has to address student interests as a profession. It, uh, if somebody wants to be a good mother, that can be a very uh, good book. And there are so many ways to work with math, reading, and writing in terms of helping somebody understand how to be a good mother. There are things to read and nutrition and uh, psychology and all sorts of things. So it doesn't have to necessarily be a defined job. I wanted to make that point before we got off. And you know, you guys can help me with the terminology. I'm sure I'm going to miss, mess this up, but um, what, what is the term um, that they're, the focus on? Is it family literacy? So that if the, the student, uh, the, the child is learning, say, in third grade, is enrolled in school in third grade, and maybe the mother is, is reading at a third grade level or whatever it may be, the idea that, you know, reading at home and, and have, finding activities that you can do as a family, um, is, it, is that called family literacy or is family? Yes. Uh, family literacy addresses the uh, helping a parent or a family uh, work with kids. So it's it's a it's a family kind of orientation, and it can be very powerful. So that might be kind of a. I know we have the special interest groups in the course looking into different types of things. That might be kind of a cool. Oh, it'd be great to see if you could devise a lesson that, um, and yeah. create within your scenario that the that's a, a mother or a father that has children at home, um, and looking at looking at it from that by that standpoint. Yeah. Okay, well, it's getting pretty quiet in the text chat, so I think we're about there. Well, thank you, everyone, so much for your time tonight, and for those of you that <laughs> Kev <laughs> fought through hurricane and chopped the horse winds or whatever, I appreciate uh, it. Yeah, it's getting really windy there, and it's, um, even where I, I hate to think what's going on in the other coast. It's really... I can't. It's, it's going to be a sad one to watch. I'm afraid. Everybody everywhere remains safe, whoever's going to be in the path yeah. of this.